Take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, to the Gospel of Luke. I wanted to preach this message last Sunday, uh, and uh, I'm grateful to be able to this morning. But the, the title is Begin Again Again, because I had actually wrapped up, we had a little short sermon series, and it was called Begin Again, and I'd actually wrapped it up, and then I was reading the Christmas story, and I realized that I'd kind of left something off. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to begin again, again, uh, if you will. Now, you remember what we were talking about. We talked about the disciples, how uh, parents were bringing their children to Jesus, and, and, and they were bringing all these little ones to Jesus, and the disciples were like, no, 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 Jesus is way too busy, he's too important, get these kids back from Jesus, and Jesus didn't like that, and he was like, no, 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 man, let the children come uh, to me. Look in your notes at Mark chapter 10, verse 15. He said, and Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. What is Jesus saying? You have to have childlike faith in him, uh, in God, just like a little child does. And what we talked about in that short sermon series was the fact that uh, I believe that children just kind of ingrained in them in who they are, they believe God and they believe the promises of God, right? A, a child with childlike faith would just absolutely, they just believe good things about God, right? They believe that God is good, that God loves them. They believe that God is for them. They believe that God forgives them. And they just believe these things almost naturally as little children. But somehow along the way, as we've gotten older and more mature and more sophisticated, somewhere along the way, we tend to lose that childlike faith. Maybe we get a little jaded. Maybe we believe that God is with us, for us, and he loves us, and he forgives us, and all of those things. We believe it in an intellectual kind of way, but where the rubber meets the road, where, where your life intersects with Monday morning, uh, you maybe aren't living like you really believe it. It's not impacting your life. So this story, this Christmas story this morning that we are going to hear, I want you to imagine for just a second that you're listening to it for the first time as a child. I'm going to move this flower. I'm going to kick this thing off this platform. There we go. But I want you to imagine that you're hearing it for the very first time like a child. Now, first of all, the scripture teaches us that it says that an angel of the Lord appeared to Mary. That an angel, now don't just take that. Now, it's not an angel like in a Christmas play when we put our little white robe on our kids and a little halo and they look so cute. That's not what this angel looked like. This is the mighty, awesome, magnificent, extremely powerful angel of God that appears to this little teenage girl, this little virgin girl. And he says this look in your Bible, Luke chapter 1, verse 28. He says, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Okay, now just, just picture the scene. The angel of the Lord says this to her, barely older than a child. And look at verse 31. Go down to verse 31 in your Bible. And it says, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. There will be no end. Now, I just want to stop for a second, though, and, and imagine you're, you're this little girl, this barely older than a child, this young teenager. And imagine what you heard in that paragraph, right? Let me tell you what Mary heard. She heard the first sentence, and she probably didn't hear a whole lot after that, all about the throne and the David, and he's going to be great. And she's, because look at verse 34. Mary says this. She says, how can this be, right? How is it that I'm going to, have, I'm going to conceive in my womb a child? How can this be since I do not know a man? In other words, Mary is saying, how is this even possible? This, this, it doesn't work. This isn't possible. Look what the angel says in verse number 35. It says, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who's to be born will be called the Son of God. Okay. Oh, wow, that is a lot for a teenage girl to take in. And then look at our key verse. Go down to verse number 37. The, uh, what the angel of the Lord says to Mary, it says, For with God, nothing will be impossible. 
Repeat, say that with me on the count of three. One, two, three. For God, nothing will be impossible. All of a sudden, a 700 year, a culmination of 700 years worth of prophecies are about to become absolutely true through this young virgin girl that, uh, and that God would come in flesh and dwell in the world and he's going to save his people. And the angel declares to Mary, well, Mary's like, you know, uh, you know, the throne of David and the Messiah. Blah, 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 blah. How am I going to have a son? I haven't known a man. And, and that angel tells her the same thing I think God wants many of us to understand this morning. Look at this next slide. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. God. And maybe you used to believe that. Maybe there's a time in your life where you're like, yeah, God can do anything. But the truth is you just kind of tip your hat to it now intellectually and it doesn't really impact your life. Now there's a big theological word here. Look at this next slide. It's the word omnipotence. What the word omnipotence means is you, well, you won't find that word in the Bible, but what you will find is the words like almighty, right? The Lord almighty, all powerful. It describes the unlimited power of God, that God can do anything. Now, why is that important? Because I guarantee you right now, this morning in this place, right here in the early service at Grace Baptist Church, there are people that need God to do something. And for you to believe that God is going to do something, you need to understand that God can do anything. That he can do anything. You might be facing some impossible challenges or some trying situation or uh, some situation that you don't know how you're going to get out of. And you genuinely need to see the power of God work in your life. Or maybe it's not you. It's for somebody else. You need to see the power of God move in the life of somebody that you know. You need an I can do anything kind of God. So my goal today is through the power of God's word and through his spirit to remind you and, and to help build your faith like a child to understand with God, all things are possible. And Christmas, man, is a wonderful time to remember with a childlike faith that our God can do anything. Write this down. This Christmas, I can believe simply that God can. He can do what? Whatever he wants. God can. It's possible. Matter of fact, the prophet Jeremiah 32 verse 17 said, Our Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. You need to look out the window sometime and see what God did out there when he spoke the universe into existence. And ask yourself, is your problem bigger than the universe? God has shown that he can do anything. And we need to get back to that simple pure truth. God can. God can. I mean, if a kid, imagine a child is praying for a puppy. It's a good Christian kid because only satanic children pray for cats. Amen. And listen, a good, if a child, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We've got some Christmas cat sweaters up here in the front. Thank you for that. But, uh, but listen, Say a child prays for a puppy. Let me see what a child does. A child prays for a puppy and then goes checks the front door and see if God's already delivered it. A simple, pure, childlike faith. But somehow we've lost it. Now we haven't lost, listen to me, we haven't lost the faith. You still believe. You've trusted Christ. You're saved. You know that God can... Da, da, da. You, you haven't lost the faith, but you've kind of lost faith. You don't really believe that God can. Not really you know, we hear it in pop you know, psychology all the time, this idea of love languages. Have you ever heard that expression before? Love languages? Like, for instance, you know, maybe your love language, you like to be petted, and, and it's a phys your love language is a physical thing. Or a lot of you ladies, maybe your love language is just a conversation, and he listens, and it's my, when he listens to me, it's my love. You, can, you know what I'm saying, anybody? We're like, that's your love language, when he just listens, you know. And, uh, and, and so, or maybe your love language is service, right? Like, I just, I know well, I love it when Alicia gets up and gets me a glass of tea. I'm like, she loves me. Amen? And so different love languages. And, and not to, not to uh, be irreverent and at all, but God's love language is faith. It's faith. 
When you believe and you trust God, when you believe that he can, that's God's love language. Faith, as a matter of fact, faith is the only way that you can even please him. Look at Hebrews 11 verse 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so when we don't have faith, when we don't really believe that God can, it's absolutely displeasing to God. Faith is the only way that we can actually please him. Do you believe that God can? Do you believe that God can save your broken marriages? Do you believe that God can fix that broken relationship? Do you believe that God can provide for you? Do you really believe that God can help you to overcome that sin that you have in your life? Do you really believe that God can heal you? Do you believe that God can heal them? Can God save those people in your life that you desperately want God to save? My God can because he says he can. Number two, write this down. It's not enough. This Christmas, I can also believe that God will. See, with a childlike faith, I can believe that God can. But there's another step to this thing, and that's actually believing that God will. I believe that God can't. I believe that God will. Now, let's take it back to the Old Testament for just a moment. You're, you're familiar with this. When two armies would do battle, what would they do? They would line one army line up over here, one army line up over here. And then this army would send their champion out, right, to fight. And this army would send their champion out. And many times, these two guys would fight it out. And then whoever won that fight, that's who won the battle. Does that make sense? And so instead of all of us fighting, we're going to send our best. You send your best. They're going to scrap it out. And that's going to determine who the winner is. And one time in the Old Testament, the, the, uh, the Philistines, they did this with the nation of Israel. Israel's lined up on this side of the valley. right? The, the, the Philistines are lined up on this side, and they send their champion out. This bad boy you might have heard of named Goliath. And so Goliath comes out in the middle of that valley every single day. He he goes up to the Israelite army, God's people, and he says, who wants some? And then every time he goes out there, everybody in the uh, Israel's army says, not me. He's a bad boy. You go first. I'm right behind you. Now, I mean, so and then Goliath does it again and again, and he's, he's blaspheming God. He's calling God all kinds of names. He's calling the nation of Israel all kinds of names. He's like, come on, you're, you're a bunch of dogs. Your God's a dog. Come on, get some. You want some? Big enough, bad enough, come get some. And everybody just kind of looks the other way like, oh, he's talking to you. He ain't talking to me. And then finally, this kid named David shows up. He should be out there with the sheep, and yet here he is. And he just happened to believe that God was bigger than Goliath. Nobody, David never got the memo to stop believing that God can and that God will. Nobody told him. And so he still believed my God can and my God will. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45 there in your notes. It said, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Verse 36, this day the Lord will, say will, he will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. You know, whenever we do murals in Sunday school classes, we never put that picture on there, right? It's always David with a, it's never with the Philistine head. All right. Sorry. This day the Lord will deliver you in my hand. I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he what? Will give you into our hands. And he took the giant down. He took his head, just like he said. He didn't just believe that God could. He believed that God would. He knew God could, and he believed that he would. With a faith that nobody else on the scene seemed to have. The king didn't have that kind of faith. None of the other soldiers, David's brothers were there. They didn't have that kind of faith. Again, David just never got the memo, right? You need to grow up. Stop believing all this God can, God will business. Listen, you know what this tells me? There just might be more faith in one of our children's Sunday school classes than there are in a lot of our homes. There just might be more faith this morning in the nursery than there is in some of our seminaries around America. There just might be more faith in little church, children's church, than there is out here in big church. Why? Because they haven't got the memo. They haven't got the memo to stop believing with a childlike faith. They read it, they believe it. 
My God is good. My God loves me. My God is for me. My God is with me. My God forgives me. And my God can do anything. You see, often we think that God can. Okay, understand this. We think that he can. We believe that. You know, God can do anything. We just don't think that he will. Look at this next slide. You believe that God might do it for somebody else, but he's not going to do it for you. You believe that God will do it for somebody You've seen God do big things in the lives of other people, but you don't really believe that he's going to do it in your life. God's never going to do it over here. He does it over there, but not over here. This Christmas, you need to get back to not only my God can, but my God will. I heard a, a pastor talking about this recently, and he, he shared how, and this is so true. In, in 2019, one of the things that we tend to do is this. We come to a conclusion, and then we look for evidence. It sounds like Congress. We come to a conclusion, we come to a conclusion, and then we look for evidence. And what, what I mean is this. For instance, if you came in here this morning, and you heard you're the friendliest church in West Tennessee, right? And if you came in here this morning, and you were looking for evidence of a friendly church, you found one. If you already decided this is going to be a friendly church, then it was. More than likely, you could find evidence pointing to, yeah, this is a friendly church. But if you came in here this morning, you already concluded before you got here that nobody's going to talk to you. Nobody likes me up there anyway. It's not a friendly church. It's a and then you come in here and you're looking for evidence for this not being a friendly church. Guess what you found? Evidence, right? And that's what we do. Many times we, we start with a conclusion and then we look for the evidence, right? And, and so and what happens with God is simply this. We don't think that he will for us. So we start looking for evidence. We start looking around for evidence. In other words, yeah, God can, but he's not going to do it for me because, you know, I, when I prayed for that job, I didn't get that job. And when I loved that boy, I didn't get that boy. He broke my heart, broke up with me. When, when, when I wanted to marry her, she said no. And, 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 and God, he's never there for me, but he's always there for others. God can, but I, I see all the evidence that he's not going to do it for me. We start with a conclusion and then we gather the evidence. But if you start with the conclusion that God is good and God loves me and God is for me, my God forgives me, and my God can do anything. If you start there and begin looking for the evidence, you'll see all of it you could ever want to find. Many times, we just think God will do it for somebody else, but he won't do it for us. Now, let's keep it real this morning. As we're talking about this, we believe that God can, and we need to believe that God will. But let's keep it real. Look at this next slide. What do you do when you know he can? And you believe that he will, but he doesn't. Because that happens. You believe he can, and you know that he will, but then he doesn't. What about those times? What about those times when you really do have faith like a child, and you see, you've seen God do bigger things for other people? Surely he could do this little thing for me, and it'll make a big difference in my life. And I know this is God's will, and I know this is God's plan, right? And it could just make my life so much different. And you ask him, and you believe, and you think he will, but he doesn't. What do you do? Now think about Mary for just a moment. Mary, put yourself in her shoes. We talked about her in the beginning. For just a moment, imagine that you are Mary. Make it personal. And you're a parent. And I want you to think of Jesus as your child. Now, you, look, you know how much you love your kids? Right? I love my kids so much it hurts. You know, amen? You know what I'm talking about? It's just incredible. Think about being Mary, knowing where Jesus is heading. The cross and the sacrifice. Imagine the cost that Mary paid. When she said in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, said, let it be to me according to your word. Think about the cost that Mary paid. This virgin girl who's not even married is going to become pregnant and be seen as an immoral outcast, looked down upon the, the social pain that she would endure. And then imagine raising the son of God and watching him grow up to maturity just to be falsely accused and brutally beaten and tortured and abused, beaten so badly that his face no longer looked like the face of a human being, being whipped and cut open so much that his organs were visible from the outside. And they put him on the cross. Imagine that's your child, that's your son, that's your Jesus that they're nailing to the cross. Now let me tell you something I know about Mary. I don't have a verse for this, but I know it. Don't you know that she had faith to believe that God could do something about that? You know she did. 
Don't you know that Mary had the kind of faith? She not only believed that God could. She's watching this. This is her baby boy. She believed that God would. God, I know that you can stop this. God, I know that you're going to stop. This is your son. This is my son. Lord, save my child. And she believed that God would. See, God did not spare his own son. God did not spare, you know, you know the, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, right? And, and scripture teaches us that God did not spare his own son and all of that. I want to remind you of this. Look at this next slide. God didn't spare Mary's son. Her son. And she's a real person. And that's really her son. And God said no. God did not spare Mary's son. What do you do when you believe that God can? What do you do when you believe that God will? And he doesn't. Write this down. This Christmas, if God says no, I still believe. I still believe. This is the deepest kind of childlike faith. When that child prays for a puppy and goes to the door and there's no puppy there, what does that child do? They just go look the next time too. Even if God doesn't do what I think he should, even if God doesn't do what I know he should, even if God doesn't do what I think that he's going to do, I believe in a God whose ways are higher than my ways. I believe in a God who's for me. I believe in a God who's with me. I believe in a God who forgives me. I believe in a God who loves me. I believe in a God who is good. And even when I don't understand and I can't see the plan, and it's not my plan, I could say with Mary, Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Lord, let it be to be according to your word. See, my faith in God isn't based on what he does. It's based on who he is. And he is our good, good, promise-keeping God. I can have faith those three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? Remember the kind of faith that they had? Right? Uh, uh, oh, King Nezer, King Nebuchadnezzar set up the, the giant idol, wanted everybody to come and bow down and worship him, worship that statue. And these three Hebrew boys, these young men, see, nobody told them to stop believing. See, nobody told them that, you know, hey, you're older now, you're more mature now, you can stop believing that God can and that God will, right? Besides, you're, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? When you're with the Babylonians, do as the Babylonians do. See, they didn't get the memo. They still believed with a childlike faith. And when it come time to bow down to the statue, they said, no, we're not going to do it. And they brought them before King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's like, maybe you boys didn't understand. I'm going to repeat it. When, hey, when the music hits, you bow down. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. Hit my music. Then, boys, we're not bowing down. And so he tells them again. They said, King, we're not going to do it. We're not going to bow down. We're only going to worship God and God alone. These three young Hebrew people. And they weren't the only ones there. There were other Hebrew people from good families and their parents read the Bible to them and they heard all the Bible stories and they went to a, a Sunday school where they didn't have David with the head chopped off on the wall and they, 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 they all knew the Bible. They all knew the stories. They knew the word of God. But for some reason, these three boys believed that God could and that God would show up for them. But even if he didn't, look in your notes at Daniel chapter 3, verse 17. They said, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able, in other words, our God can, to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Because we believe our God can, and because we believe that our God will, and even if he doesn't, we still believe we're not going to worship this false idol. If God can bring us the Savior of the world uh, to earth to walk among men by a virgin, a miraculous virgin birth, God can do anything. And this morning, the most important thing, if you're a believer or an unbeliever, the most important thing that you need to realize this morning and to live your life based on this truth is the fact that God can and he will. If he's promised it, he's going to deliver. But even if he doesn't, you still believe. 
Because you serve a God whose ways are higher than your ways. And he's got a plan and a purpose for your pain and for your suffering, for your mountaintops and your valleys. And he's working in your life and through your life and in the lives of others in ways that you're never going to understand on this side of eternity. But your God can and he will. But when he says no, you need to still believe. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, help us. God, I just pray that you would minister to your people in a way that would bring about just life-changing faith. Lord, give us that blessed Christmas hope. Lord, as we seek your presence and your power in our life. Listen, guys, every head bowed, every eye closed. Be respectful of those around you for just a moment. You're here this morning. You know that you're saved. You know that you've been forgiven. You know that you've been redeemed, right? You are his and he is yours. You know that for a fact. But right now in this moment, just being honest, just between you and God, you'd say right now, God, I need your presence. God, I need to believe that you can. I need to know that you will. But it, Lord, even if not, I still trust in you. God, I need a a touch from you. Lord, I need your presence. Maybe not you. Maybe you know somebody else that needs God's presence even now in this moment. Is that your prayer this morning? God, help me to experience your presence and understand that you can all over the sanctuary. Father God, I just pray. God, knowing that you know the details for every person here, the ones that raised their hands or those that didn't, Lord, I pray that you would do what only you can do in our lives, and that's glorify yourself in each situation. Or whatever the situation is, we believe you can. We believe you will. But Lord, even if your answer is no, we still believe in you and we trust you and your, your plan for our lives. Lord, deepen our faith in you. Listen, guys, every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. Listen, you're here this morning. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't let another Christmas go by without knowing the Savior of the world, the very one who we sing the songs about. God planned for you to be here at this very moment so that you can respond to his gospel. Look up for just a second. Isn't the virgin birth kind of strange? All right, have you I've thought about it? Why was the virgin birth? necessary because of the virgin birth Jesus was born without a sin nature see something you need to know about yourself is this you're you're a sinner by choice and a sinner by nature you inherited a sin nature Jesus didn't inherit the sin nature because uh, he inherited his nature from his heavenly father who's without sin and because he started without the sin nature and he never sinned He could be that perfect, spotless sacrifice that we need for our sins. He was all man, fully man, fully God. Lived this life just like me and you, yet without sin. So that he could pay the price on Calvary. When God did not spare Mary's son, God did not spare his son. And Jesus, if you know from scripture... God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus, without sin, perfect in every way, righteous, in ways that we're never righteous. And that was all possible because of the virgin birth, which was the culmination of prophecy. God is perfect, and he's got a perfect standard. And we all mess up. Now, so ultimately, what is Christmas all about? Look at this next verse. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come. What does that mean? At exactly the right time. Not too soon, not too late. According to the prophecies. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So you're born, we, all God's children, you're only God's child when he's adopted you into his family. And you can only be adopted into the family when you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. That's me and you. We talk about this all the time, but we cannot keep that perfect righteous standard. I mean, think about God's moral law. Right? All of us here this morning, we're, we've lied, we've stolen, 
right? We've, uh, we've coveted things that other people had. Uh, we've all sinned and fallen short. None of us measure up to the standard of the law. That's why Christ came, perfectly fulfilled that standard, because we couldn't. Jesus was that bridge to our Heavenly Father that we needed. We could never get there on our own, but he did it for us. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. That's your only hope of ever having a relationship with God, of ever being forgiven of your sins, being adopted into the family of God. Will you pray with me one more time? Those of you here this morning, you realize, you know what? God is calling me, man. I need God's grace. I need his mercy. I need his power. I need God. I want to give my life to God. I need him. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Those of you this morning that would say, I'm not here by accident. Today, by faith, through Christ, I'm going to give my heart, give my life to God. Listen, guys, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here right now and you know that you need to pray to receive Jesus Christ, just between me and you, Listen, I will not single you out. I will not embarrass you in any way, I promise. But I just want the honor of praying with you. And so if you're here and right now in this moment, you'd like to pray to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. you do me a favor and just slip your hand up for just a moment? I see you. Who else? Amen. Listen, even if you didn't raise your hand just then, why don't you pray this prayer? It's not this prayer. It's not some kind of magical formula. It's not a password. It's simply you talking to God, humbling yourself to God. And and you can say something like this and say, Father God, I'm a sinner. Tell him, say, Lord, I sin. But Lord, I'm turning from my sin and I'm turning to Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Just tell him. Say, Lord, I am trusting you, your death, burial, and resurrection for my salvation. All of me, I surrender to all of you. Save me, Jesus. Listen, you just prayed that prayer. You just received the Holy Spirit. You've got resurrection power in your life. You've been forgiven. You've been redeemed if you've truly trusted Christ this morning. Maybe you're here this morning. You've prayed that prayer some other time. I want to encourage you to make that decision public this morning. You need to follow through with believer's baptism. You need to be baptized. Maybe you're here this morning and your baptism's on the wrong side of your salvation. You know it. God knows it. You need to get that in the right order. We get saved and then we get baptized. Why don't you come this morning and we'll celebrate with you and rejoice with you and schedule that time for you. Maybe this morning God is calling you to make it official. This is your church home. Grace Baptist Church is your church home. It's time to make it official and become an official member of the Grace Baptist family to put on the jersey, be part of the team right here at Grace. Why don't you come this morning and we'll rejoice with you and pray with you about that decision. But this morning, this Sunday before Christmas, whatever you do, Be obedient to the Christ who came to redeem and to save. Father God, we surrender this invitation to you. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me? You come. Don't wait. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest.